All right, while they're taking up the offering, if you go ahead and take your Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to continue in our sermon series, To Be or Not To Be. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 and hearing from Paul. He's writing to the uh, church at Thessalonica, hearing from Paul and finding out the instructions he's giving to them, then applying those instructions to our lives as well. What are we to be? What are we to uh, act like? What are, what are we to do? And so this has been a great series for us already. We started out with a doozy two weeks ago. We did, um, or three weeks ago. We started out with the, the, the two things that are, were the most difficult. The first is being holy. And we found out that week that holiness is a complete setup. God told us uh, that He wants us to be holy, right? So He gave holiness to us through His Son. He's making holiness real to us through the process of sanctification. So we're expected to be holy. We've been set up to be holy. And then we talked about loving that Sunday as well. Be loving. That was another tough one. God loves us. He commands us to love one another. He's given us the perfect model through His Son. We know how to do it, so we are to be loving as well. And then the last sermon that we did, we talked about the importance of being diligent and hopeful. And we said that we are to be diligent. And when we are that way, there may be no fame, but there's always respect uh, for those who work hard, who mind their own business, who work in the background and being diligent about their work. But we're also to be hopeful. That's living a life of hope to the world, an assurance, not a wish, but an assurance. We know that when we read and know the Bible, um, we know those hard times are coming. When we read and know the Bible, we'll have something that's anchored to our soul that will keep us, keep us in His good grace. And so we are to live hopeful. Today, I want to talk about being appreciative to your leaders, your spiritual leaders, church leaders, and also being obedient to God. So that's the two, two B's that we're going to talk about today. And I can just be real honest with you, can I? I usually am. Just real blunt with you and forthright and transparent as I can be. I did not want to preach the first part of this sermon. I, I didn't. I mean, I'm supposed to tell you, hey... God wants you to respect me, and if He doesn't, you're a sinner. Okay, I'm supposed to tell you that today? That's what I'm really supposed to say, God? So he and I had a conversation about it. God, I'm not comfortable giving this, this sermon. And he reminded me of the passage in, in Timothy that says, um, all Scripture is, is useful. It's all useful for re reproving and, and in, in, increasing people's faith. Preach all of the Scriptures. Okay, God, I, I'll, I'll preach it today. So today in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, we're going to find out we're supposed to be appreciative to our church leaders. Here's what it says. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem those or esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. He addresses the relationship between the church and its leaders. The leaders in the church have a threefold work. I, you may not know this, so I, I want to tell you this. They have a threefold work. And the first part of it is, is simply laboring. We are to labor as leaders. Greg and I are supposed to labor. Your deacons are supposed to labor. Your life group leaders, they're laborers. Sometimes that's to the point of exhaustion. So I'm, I, I'm going to be as transparent as I can be today. Sometimes serving you is exhausting. It's just tiring. It is, because there's so many of you. In addition to praying and studying and preparing, we're also expected to, to be there on, on hospital days, on days of happy events. We're expected to be there to watch uh, some of your children and grandchildren and their hobbies and their sports, and we love doing those things. But in addition to that, we do weddings and worship services and weekly meetings. We do lunch, we deliver materials, we do down and out ministry, conflict resolution, bylaw and constitution work, volunteer substitutions. We're to be proficient in marketing and management and social studies and English and public speaking, computer software, internet, social sites, which I stay away from, but Greg gives me updates. It's good news. We take those midnight calls and sometimes we get up and take the trips to the hospital or 
even to the bar to find that church member that can't get home. And we pick them up and take them home and love on them. We're going to do this all the while while we maintain confidential transparency. You tell me how that works. We do funerals for people and their pets. We do housework, yard work, homework. Our work and our personal lives are so intertwined that many days there's not a defining line between the two. Our wives are completely involved in our ministry. And did I mention that at any given point half of the people in the church don't need your ministry or want your ministry and the other half that do think you're doing it wrong? <laughs> that happens. It's hard work. We labor, but not only do we labor, we have to oversee that literally means to stand before you and lead you towards righteousness. We're, we're tightrope artists. We've got to be loving and encouraging and hopeful, yet we've got to be challenging, we've got to step on toes, and the whole time we've got to somehow avoid meddling while getting all into the deep recesses of your life. How do we do that? Oh, and did I mention that we're held accountable for it? We are. I, I'm going to stand before God and God's going to say, you, you, you did know Joe was having an affair, right? Yes, sir. Well, you, you did say something to him, right? You, you did go after him. You did, you did show him the word. You, you did those things, right? You, you didn't let go of him, right? Yes, sir, I, I tried. Every spiritual leader has to answer to God for how he worked in the lives of the people in the church. So we labor, we oversee. The Bible says we also admonish. That's a churchy word. It means to warn, maybe to chap somebody a little bit. Or to even encourage them. We have to do this very carefully, so we have to use the teachings of the Bible. Otherwise, it becomes real subjective and we become hypocritical. So we just say, hey, don't take it from me. This is what God says in His Word. So like I told you in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures breathed out by God is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And there's punishment for teaching it wrong. If we get it wrong, we're punished. We're held accountable. That's why the scriptures are very plain. Not many of you should attempt to be teachers because you're going to be held to a stricter set of guidelines. There's punishment for teaching it wrong. So we have to be excruciatingly careful to teach the truth of God's Word because we literally, literally speak on His behalf. And He's going to hold us accountable for every single word. So Paul challenges the readers in this passage to what he says, respect and esteem church leaders. Maybe your Bible says to recognize and esteem. Whether it's respect or recognize, neither one of them encapsulate the full meaning of what that word meant to people at that time. It meant that you're to know them well enough to see their value. To see their calling and their value and know them well enough to see their gifts. And then to esteem them, to think rightly of them because of their special service. Now at the end of that passage, Paul says, and be at peace among yourselves. He kind of throws that in. And he knows that a leader's job is so much easier when there's peace, even peace in the church. So don't miss the reciprocal nature between appreciation and peace. When you appreciate your pastors and keep peace in the church, it's natural for them to respond with more acts of service, more loving acts of service. So to be or not be appreciative and peaceful, that is the question. It's indeed a challenge for us. By the way, thank you. Last, last month was Pastor Appreciation Month. It's a nationwide thing. Many of you sent cards and notes and and uh, that awesome board with the children's things they wrote about Greg and I on there, that was priceless. Thank you. Thank you for encouraging us in that way. I want to tell you that Jill and I and Greg and Lori, we, we count it a privilege to serve you and to be here with you most days. We do. It's a joy to be here. 
It's a joy to be with you and to serve you. And when you thanked us last month, that made it even more enjoyable. So thank you. So we know that we have to be appreciative because when you're appreciative, it's, it forms this cycle. And God set this up, by the way. Forms this cycle. I appreciate you. Okay, I'm going to do for, more for you. I appreciate you. Okay, I'll do this again. And that's how that works. Everybody knows that's how it works. So we're to be appreciative to our church leaders. That includes our deacons. That includes our life group leaders and those in positions of authority. Appreciate them. But secondly, he talks about, he gives them several things. And really, if you lump it all together, he, he says that the to be this week is to be obedient to God. Look at verses 14 and following of 1 Thessalonians 5. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good, to love, I mean, to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God, of Christ, in Christ Jesus for you. And do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. He's wrapping up his letter, so he's doing what every single mother in this room does when their child is walking outside the door. They're going to give them a shotgun list of reminders. That's what you do. Don't forget your lunch, don't forget to turn in your homework, don't forget to say thank you. And we, we send all of these don't forget statements toward them. It's a shotgun list of commands. He says, be encouraging, be helpful, be patient, don't retaliate, do good, um, uh, pray, rejoice, be thankful always, let the Spirit do His work, do good and avoid evil. This is, notice, this is very, very simple language. That's not very Paulish. It's not. Paul would give a point and then he would give lots of reasoning in front of it and lots of reasoning behind it, usually when he tells the church something. But here, it's one after the next. Boom, 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 boom. It's a shotgun approach. That tells me that Paul knew these people and he knew that they already knew those things. So he's sending them these reminders. All of it's very simple except for one. Test the prophecies to see if they're from the Lord. That might have been simple to them, but that's not simple to us. We don't practice that too much. We don't really know what that means. That word prophecy, it, it can be a spoken word, but usually it's a spoken word about the written word of God. It's a sermon. It's a teaching. It's a doctrine or a belief. Test those things according to the word of God to see which one is real because some pastors will lie to you and manipulate you to try to behave in certain ways so that you will bless the church and bless them. And those pastors who do that in a manipulative way will have to answer before God one day. They will. They simply will. So in those moments, we have to test what is being said. We have to test what is being said to see if that's really what the Scripture says. Because I can be honest with you, some pastors get it wrong. It wasn't that long ago I preached a sermon here on repentance. And it seemed like I was starting to go down a wrong path doctrinally about repentance. And I may have if I'd have continued on in that path. And a mature believer in the church came to me and he said, Mike, you're getting dangerous and I don't want you to lead the church down the wrong path when it comes to the doctrine of repentance. And I said, okay. And so I had to correct that. I had to fix that. Some of you remember that. I sent out the email and I talked about it. Sometimes a pastor can get it wrong. Hopefully this is always by accident. We get it wrong time to time. So we have to test what is being taught. For example, Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, one of the most heavily quoted passages in the entire Bible by people outside the church. Judge not, lest you be judged. That's become the mantra to get people off of your back morally. That has. You tell someone, hey man, that's not right. You shouldn't be living that way. Don't you judge me. You're not supposed to judge according to your Bible. That's what they say, don't they? Don't judge. But is that what the Bible really says? We're, we're to test 
prophecies, test doctrines to see it's of God. If you continue in Matthew chapter 7, it says, Don't give to dogs what is holy or throw pearls before pigs. How do you judge that? And then in 17 through 20, it talks about the fruit. You know, a, a good tree will bear good fruit. A bad tree will bear bad fruit. And you're to, to kind of discern between those things. Well, how do you do that without judging? And don't forget, there's a book in the Bible called Judges. <laughs> God sent men to the nation of Israel to be judges. And if that's not enough, Jesus said in, in that same chapter, in verse 24, he's teaching in the temple. The people said he had a demon. He said, stop judging by mere appearances. Instead, judge correctly. So, Matthew 7, 1, don't judge lest you be judged. That's only in certain situations, I guess, because Jesus clearly says right after that, judge correctly. You are to judge correctly. So we get from that. What do we get from that? Well, if we're balancing that through all of Scripture, if we're testing like He tells us to test, we find out that superficial, hypocritical, uh, unforgiving, self-righteous, untrue judgment is always wrong. It's always wrong. But... If we judge with discernment and for the betterment out of love wanting to help somebody, it's not only appropriate, it's necessary. We have to do those things. So see, some people get the wrong idea of scriptures and they'll start applying in places that weren't supposed to be uh, uh, applicable and then all of a sudden we're believing wrong things. So we have to test what we know and what we believe, what we hear from our our, our preachers and our teachers and sometimes even ourselves. So this is one of the ways he's telling us to be obedient in this shotgun approach. And he gives a little explanation to any of these. So he must just be reminding us. Well, why do we need the reminder? Well, in short, because we forget. Right? We forget stuff. Of course we know that. But not only that, we need reminders because we are what I like to call a hot mess of the L's. We are messed up with lust, laziness, and a lack of consideration for where God is. We are. We're... we're Sometimes we just get lazy. We're, we're tired. We're tired of fighting the good fight. Tired of continuing on in the faith. And we get, we get tired of saying no to the devil and no to our own flesh. And, and we get tired. I know that. And we get lazy. You know, there's a reason why the military trains so hard. They don't, if you're in boot camp, you don't get the opportunity to be lazy at all. Even on your day off on Sunday, you got to do work. There's no laziness in the military. That's because you can't be lazy and be a soldier. And you can't be lazy and be a super servant of God either. You just can't. And it doesn't go together. We need to be reminded of that time to time. But we also deal with the, the lust issue. Our flesh is screaming out for satisfaction. And sometimes it's easier to say yes. It is. Just to get our flesh to shut up for just a minute. It's just easier to say yes, but it's not right. We're never supposed to stop fighting against the flesh. I need this. I'm not going to be happy without this. I must have this, whatever it is. It's your flesh screaming for satisfaction, and we're messed up in that. We're also messed up with a lack of consideration of whom we're serving and where God is, forgetting that He is right there. We think we're by ourselves. We think we have a moment where we can entertain lustful thoughts or look at the wrong things or say the wrong things or watch the wrong things, and we forget that God is right there, looking right over our shoulder, right into our mind and into our heart watching so yes we need to be reminded from time to time that we must fight these things and be obedient obedience uh, is a tough word today right because we're all 
mature and know what's the best for our lives. And we're Americans. We have rights. So obedience is tough today. I know that. I, I feel that too sometimes. The deacons will call me on the carpet and tell me something and the, and the hair will stick up on the back of my neck and I get all bowed up and start growling just like you. It's hard to be submissive to one another. But we must be. God calls us to be submissive to one another. Well, why? Why is that so important? Listen to John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Well, there's a pretty good reason to obey God's word. If you love him, he sees that in your obedience. That's tough for us. I know it's tough. And sometimes we turn that around and get it wrong. I, I must obey God so that he'll love me. That's not true. God's going to love you. We obey God out of, out of thanksgiving, out of love for him. Yeah, I'm going to try to be best, God, because I love you. has nothing to do with how you feel about me. I love you, so I'm going to do this for you. We're obedient to God in that way. But also, he says, that we'll receive a full dose of the Holy Spirit who will be with us forever. So notice the reciprocal effect of this too. When we are obedient to God, the Holy Spirit who fills us will help fight laziness and lust and lack of consideration for God, making it easier to be obedient again. You see how that works? Round and round and round. So to be or not be obedient, this is really a no-brainer. Let's listen to what God says and try our very best to do this. Now I just want to give you some pastorly advice today. Oh, don't try to do this by yourself. Especially you men. Don't, don't, don't think that you're, you're so manly you can do this by yourself. Because you can't. I can't. Women can't either. We, we can't do it by ourselves. We're, we're, we get tired and there's no one else to pick us up. We go down the wrong path and there's no one there to say, hey, come back. We can't do this by ourselves. We're just not good enough. But together, with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be if we're committed to being obedient to God. So we have to know his word. We got to know his commands. We have to be obedient to him. So let's do that together. It is hard enough by ourselves. It is. Would you commit to finding one other person that believes like you and just letting them into your secret world and say, I need you to pray for this and this and this because I struggle with it and nobody else knows about that but I'm sharing it with you because I need your prayer and I need your accountability would you find someone like that I did and it has helped me tremendously I'm not perfect but I'm better you can be too so let's be obedient together let's go through that together so in that question of to be or not to be, it really is a no-brainer. Let's work together towards that. Let's pray.